Again, that's Philippians chapter 3, uh, verses 12 to 16. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in, any, if in anything else you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time that we have together to study your word and uh, to be convicted by it, to be encouraged by it. I pray that you would speak through me this morning, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Throughout Paul's writings, uh, he uses sports references and illustrations. Uh, John MacArthur says that he's pretty sure Paul was a sports fan simply because of how often he talks about sports. Paul talks about racing, he talks about fighting, boxing, he uses languages or language that brings out images of training in a gym, athletic words that only uh, bring those things to mind. He talks about training for godliness in a way that, that makes you think that he is picturing someone that is just lifting weights continuously, that is a gym rat, and that's how he describes how we should be about our godliness. What's required to be successful in sports, and I think this is why Paul uses it, why God uses it through Paul, is that it needs, you need a single-minded focus on the goal. That as soon as there is anything in your mind uh, that distracts you from the goal, you start to get soft, you start to not work as hard or strain forward as well. I was actually just listening to, or I saw a video of a, of a cyclist, Lance Armstrong, who we all know was at the top of his game. There's other controversies there, but that's not important. Um, but he, one of the things he was talking about with cycling is that as soon as, as someone has kids, as soon as someone has a family, they don't sprint as hard at the end of the race. That is, they start to rub elbows next to, next, well, really collide elbows next to the guy next to him. There's, there's that part, well, I don't, know, I don't know if I want to get hurt. I want to be able to, I mean, even just simply pick up my kids at, at the end of this race. They lose their edge, and I would say rightfully so, but they lose their edge. They don't have that single-minded focus. I had a friend who uh, was pretty good at football. He went to a, a camp, and he was a small town. It wasn't Tatchby, but it was a, a town like ours. Small town, uh, one high school, one football team. He was good on that, on that team. And he said he, when he got to the camp, he realized that he did not have this same drive as these other players. That they just, they, he, they didn't need to flip a switch. That switch was always flipped that they were always singularly focused on that sport. And in our work towards godliness, Paul is telling us that we must have that same single-minded focus, that it's necessary for our growth and our sanctification. One of the marks of a true, mature believer is to have a tunnel vision on becoming more like Jesus for the glory of God. Now that's what this passage sets us up for. Paul is shifting really into an application part, the practical side of his letter, and he starts with our single-minded focus. This morning we have three points. First, know the foundation. Second, pursue the goal. And third, take hold of the mindset. So point number one, know the foundation. To understand what Paul is getting at here, I want us to look back at, at the conclusion of his argument against the Judaizers. At, in Philippians 3, 8 to 11, Nathan preached on this last week. It says this, Indeed, I count everything as loss for the surpassing worth, or because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. 
For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul's, Paul is saying that his focus here is obtaining this alien righteousness, as, as Martin Luther calls it, that it's a righteousness from outside of us, that it depends on faith and it comes from God, he says in verse 10 there. Not from Paul. The Judaizers, the, the legalists would have you believe that your righteousness is something that you can really just pull up your bootstraps and figure it out. That you earn this righteousness. Paul is saying that is not the case at all. And there's even a slight chance that Paul's point could be confused here. That someone might think that Paul thinks he's already attained it. That the apostles, though they're all righteous, God... God, they saw Jesus face to face, so they must be righteous. But that's not the case. Paul is very clear about that in verse 12. He says, not that I've already obtained this, the resurrection from the dead, this this righteousness from outside of me, or that he's already perfect. And I think he uses that word to just remind you of what the the Judaizers were thinking, or this lie that, that you could become perfect. No, Paul says, I've not, I'm not there yet. I am still a sinner. I still struggle with temptation. And if you, if you know Paul's writings, he talks about that. 1 Corinthians 15, he looks forward to the resurrection. That it's something that comes in the future. Romans 7, 15 to 18, he says, For I do not understand my own actions. This is talking about his own sinfulness. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. He knew that he was sinful. He knew that he still struggled to be righteous as God has called him to do it. That doesn't, this obviously does not sound like a man who thinks he's perfectly righteous. This is a man who is in the trenches in the fight against sin. He clearly knows where he stands before the Lord. He struggles with sin and openly admits it. He talks about running the race with purpose. And he, I mean, this is the same the very same race that we are running now. Paul went before us on. And I say that because obviously Paul is not still here. Let's look at what he says in these next few words. This is his mindset here. So he's he's shown his humility, and then he talks about this mindset. He says, but I press on to make it my own. This is back in Philippians 3.12. I press on and make it my own despite the fact that I've not already arrived. Despite the fact that I still struggle with sin, Paul continues to strive to make righteousness, to pursue Christ-likeness, the resurrection from the dead, knowing Christ fully, he is striving forward to make it his own. This is, that's the intensity of this language. He says he presses on to make it his own, this unrelenting, ongoing pursuit to capture, to seize, uh, to to seize in his grasp permanently. That's the the intensity of this word. I feel like in in the English, the press on kind of loses that to some degree. But this combination of words has been found in Greek writings to be used in a military way. That the army presses on, they strive forward to make the, their enemy their own. To capture them, to seize them, to overtake them. That's the same idea here. That we are pressing on to make righteousness our own. To capture it and to seize it. This goes in line with, 
the rest of the athletic illustrations I already talked about. Whether he's talking about racing or boxing, there's this relentless pursuit of victory. It's like teams that at the beginning of the season, even though they're terrible, at the beginning of the season, the championship is on their mind. That's their focus. That's their drive. And in, even, in an even more important way, Paul is saying his drive, his focus, is Christ-likeness. One singular focus. Even though he's in a losing battle, and I think we often forget that, that Paul knew that in this life he wasn't going to be righteous. Paul seems to have this drive, this almost competitive drive, but he doesn't let it get to the point where he's like, you know what, I'm not going to win, so I'm just going to give up. He didn't say, what's the point? I'm already saved, so why read my Bible? Why spend time studying who God is, studying theology? Why spend my time doing all of these things when I'm already there, so to speak, when I've already been justified, when Jesus already did the work? Why would I work this hard? Why, why would I, Paul, put my life on the line if I'm already saved? Isn't that good enough? Isn't that the goal? Why strain for something that has already been promised? Well, Paul gives us a clear answer in the last part of this verse. He presses on to make it his own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I mean, these are astounding words, especially when you consider who Paul was before he was saved. Jesus made the man who was breathing threats against the church his own. And not only that, he made him an apostle to the Gentiles, to the one who would go out to the nations so that they would hear the gospel and be saved. Jesus clearly did the work on Paul's, on Paul's heart, and Paul is acting in response. Paul didn't just, on the way to Damascus, be like, you know what? The Christians are right. I think this, I've just been thinking about it, and they're right. No, he, he got knocked off his high horse, so to speak, maybe literally and, physic and, and physically, or um, figuratively, and God changed his heart. And the same holds true for us. We may not have as dramatic of a testimony as Paul, but that doesn't change the fact that your heart of stone, if you're a believer, was turned to a heart of flesh. That you're given a new heart and your righteous actions are done in response or out of that new heart for the glory of God. Now, there's several implications in what Paul is saying here. Some of them I've already touched on, but I want to make them clear. First and foremost, Jesus seized Paul. That already happened. That was at the beginning, obviously, of Paul's sanctification, that he was made new. Piper paraphrases this, or, or gives his own translation of this verse, and says, I have been securely seized by Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. That, that Jesus didn't just kind of hold Paul loosely when he saved him, but he was securely seized by Jesus. And that's a key, key truth for us today, that we have been securely seized by Christ. That once you're saved, you are always saved. That yes, there's times of, of great fruit and great progress and other times of spiritual drought, but that doesn't change the fact that you have been seized by Christ. Because he is the one who has done the work. I can say from my own experience that when I've struggled with the assurance of my salvation, it's because I pointed, I was looking at my own work, which, like Paul says, isn't worth anything when we look at Christ. That there is value to righteousness, but when you look at Christ, there is the foundation for our righteousness. He is the one who did the work. He's the one who changed our hearts. Everything we do is in response to him. We don't measure up to him and that is okay. I would even say that that, that is great because I don't want to measure up to Christ because that means that he's not good enough. But he is far greater than I am. He's far greater than we are and he did 
the work. We don't seize Christ and force him to justify us. This isn't wrestle, like Jacob wrestling with God. That's not what faith is. Faith is a gift given to us. Jesus seizes us and gives us the faith that justifies. That's what Paul is laying out here. He clearly had his own testimony when he's, when he's talking in this section that uh, he gives it briefly. That he, everything he did was sinful. But Jesus saved him permanently and there was a clear change. And it was only because of this seizing that Paul pursued righteousness. That's why he had a singular focus. Because Jesus seized him. That's the foundation of our pursuit of righteousness, that Jesus has made us his own. But we want to earn our own righteousness so that we can boast. That's at the heart of legalism, that we can boast in our works. But that's not how it works. That's not the way that salvation and sanctification and righteousness works. God is jealous for his glory. And so our works ought to point others to God. We boast in God. Christ seizing us as the foundation for the good and righteous deeds that we do because it glorifies God. John 15, 8, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. God is glorified when we bear fruit, showing that we are disciples. Jesus doesn't say that we bear much fruit and earn our discipleship, earn a place on the roster. Jesus is saying you are proving to be disciples, showing the new heart that you've been given, that we've been given, not earning it, but showing it. The Judaizers claimed that you needed to add works to faith. The Bible is clear that this is not the case. That faith, when we, show, or when we put our faith in Jesus, we are saved, we are justified, we are declared righteous. And out of that comes our righteous deeds. It is through these good works that we are showing our love and our commitment to God. It is through these works that we are glorifying God, that our lives are living sacrifices. These actions show where our priorities lie and that all starts with having the right reason for what we do. If you're doing what, what people would consider righteous actions so that you can be praised or that people can think, oh, that's a good Christian right there, you're doing it wrong. We should be doing right actions regardless of what other people think. And I think there's a greater, I know there's a greater and greater divide between those who are, are doing right actions for praise from the world and those who are doing right actions for praise from God. We act righteously again because we have been seized by Christ. One commentator put, says it this way. He says, the Bible will not allow us to nurture a sense of independence. We love because he first loved us. We work because he works in us. We can make the resurrection and knowing Christ our own because he has made us his own. This mindset gives us the assurance, not only gives us the assurance we ought to have as believers, but it is the whole reason we pursue godliness out of response to, for what Jesus has done for us. Christ has made us his own, so we ought to make him our own. And while this statement seems that it could stand on its own, Paul is not fleshing it out, or Paul is not done fleshing it out. So first we know the foundation, that Christ has made us his own, so we strive, we press on to make him our own. Second, we pursue the goal. Verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. Again, Paul is clear that he's not made it, that he has not reached the pinnacle. He doesn't want you to think too highly of him. He's an example of what we should follow in humility. Obviously, Christ is the first and foremost example. Paul laid that out in this letter. But we can even see Paul pursuing Christ in his own humility. 
He doesn't fall into the trap of thinking he's made it. He doesn't, that doesn't stop him, or sorry, he doesn't fall into the trap of thinking he's made it, but it doesn't stop him from calling us to follow his example. Humility doesn't just mean you're self-deprecating all the time. Paul isn't saying, I'm terrible, I'm terrible, look to Christ, I'm terrible, look to Christ. In a few verses, he'll, he'll say, imitate me as I follow Christ. Follow my example. He knows he has confidence in his actions. That is true humility, that you know exactly where you stand. This humility is clear as he addresses the Philippians. He says, brothers. He's putting himself alongside them, alongside us. He doesn't say, uh, he doesn't talk to them in a condescending way. Instead, he's, he is right alongside them. He's putting himself alongside us. That eliminates any thought that pursuing godliness and a greater knowledge of God is for the spiritually elite, for the, for the apostles. This pursuit is for all of us. Paul is encouraging this church to continue to pursue righteousness. So he says, brothers, I do not consider that I made it my own, but one thing I do. One thing he has made his own, one thing he has seized, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. This is the one thing he's seized. Not righteousness, not not the resurrection, not fully knowing Jesus. No, the one thing he has seized is the single-minded tunnel vision on straining towards godliness. That everything he does in his life is for the purpose of godliness. And again, he uses, like I said, an athletics illustration, that of an endurance runner. He is straining forward to what lies ahead. That it is a continual long pursuit of righteousness. It's not a sprint. It's not a a quick start and stop, 15 seconds. No, it is hours of running if we're going to keep going with this illustration. And honestly, it's the perfect illustration, which is why God uses it. And if you've ever met someone that's training for a marathon, everything becomes about the marathon. And and necessarily so. It's not just out of this... this, uh, obsession necessarily, but it's because they, the marathon is so grueling that everything has to become about it. You talk about your training, you research your training, you research your food, uh, you look at different shoes, you go through four or five different shoes, you talk again about your food, your training, you're always constantly looking into it because that's, that's what everything is focused on. Otherwise, you're not going to do well in the marathon. You'll get asked about the marathon. They can't help but talk about it. Their focus is the race. Partially out of, not really necessarily out of a lack of self-control, but out of necessity. Because it requires so much training ahead of time. If you want to run the race well, if you want to finish, you have to have a single-minded focus on the race and preparation for that race. And Paul isn't picturing or painting this picture of a running enthusiast. This is a professional runner that their entire lives are built around running. You run run to win the race. Everything else is supplemental. Another job, you do that to make ends meet. Kurt Warner, he's not a runner. He was a football player. He's a quarterback. But he's a good example of this. When he was in arena football after he was done with the NFL or cut from the NFL for a little bit, he bagged groceries to make ends meet until the NFL called again. He didn't say to the Cardinals when they called him, no, I I really like my job at Albertsons. I'm just a big-time grocery bagger here. No, instead, he dropped everything as soon as what his singular focus was. He got back and picked up uh, picked back up in his sport. Their life and their work is running hours and hours and training and recovery and everything that's required for it because that is necessary. And that's the mindset that we have to have, that we have to share when it comes to Godliness. Just look at the words that he's talking about. Forgetting what lies behind. 
It's not amnesia or um, really just com- actually forgetting about it, but it's what Paul's already talked about, counting it as loss. Paul isn't, hasn't just forgotten about what tribe of Israel he was from or even all of the knowledge that he gained about God through his training as a Pharisee. No, it's, it's loss when compared to Christ. They are not considered as he strains forward to what lies ahead. Former sins don't prevent him from pursuing godliness. Former good deeds don't either. But he strains forward to what lies ahead, exerting himself to the fullest. All his energy goes toward reaching the goal and finishing well. That doesn't mean that it's just this all-out sprint. We all know that marathons aren't all-out sprints. But it's getting there, it's pacing yourself well, knowing the right pace for the moment. Verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Again, it's this illustration of running, that he's focused solely on the goal. That when he's in the midst of godliness in this race, his mind is controlled by nothing else. By nothing other than standing at the top of the podium, holding his trophy in hand. Spiritually, what's the prize? Obviously, this is an illustration. Things break down. There isn't actually one singular winner in the race towards godliness. So what is the prize? It is the prize of the upward call. Now, digging into the grammar may may distract from what's clearly the, the point here. The upward call is the believer's calling by God. That initial call to faith. And that prize is what's promised to us, what lies ahead, what Paul's already talked about in verses 10 and 11 of this same chapter. He says, that I may know him, knowing Christ, the power of his resurrection, may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and this is it, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That by any means possible, he may finish the race in obtain what was promised. The application for us is clear. That we have this same tunnel vision as Paul. That we have this singular focus, this singular mindset on the prize. He talks about it again later in this chapter, but our, verses uh, 20 to 21, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. The prize of the upward call is that one day we will, we will be made completely new, that we will be sinless, that we will have a glorious resurrection body, we will be dwelling in the presence of the Lord and made righteous. That what Paul talks about in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, again, this is instructions to husbands, but what we see is Christ's love for the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish." That's the prize of the upward call. Holy without blemish. That's what we are pressing on for. Gordon Fia, a theologian, says the prize is the ultimate reason for, for running. No mere celery, celery wreath for Paul. His prize is of surpassing worth by far. To gain for Christ fully and completely. That should be an encouragement to us. That's the prize. It's promised to us. If you're in a time of spiritual drought where where your morning devotion time or whenever you take your devotion time doesn't seem as fruitful, that your fellowship with God doesn't seem as deep, you don't seem to be making as much progress, know that the prize is promised. Continue to strive for it. Continue to work on it even during this time of spiritual drought. 
or maybe you're in the midst of trials. These trials are not permanent. Our sinful world is not permanent. Your sinful, broken down bodies, our sinful, broken down bodies are not permanent, but they will be made new. You have brothers and sisters running alongside you. More importantly, God has equipped you for this life, for the trials that you're experiencing. It's a guarantee, but we still do the work. You cannot quit running and expect to receive a prize at the end of the race. Again, that's not a question of whether or not your salvation is secure, but are you proving to be a disciple of Christ? Are you showing the fruits of salvation? And if you're running in a, if you're not in a a time of trial or you're in a time of great spiritual growth, keep it up. These times, write, write it down in your journals about it. Thank God for it. Commit these things to memory because times of spiritual drought, which do come, are you're encouraged through them by remembering your times of growth. We can be confident that we will be rewarded because of the promises of God. And it's not by our own works that we can be confident, but it's because God has sent us his spirit as our helper. John 14, I'm kind of going to kind of bounce through it, but talks about this promise. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. It's not a mistake that these two things are linked, that we keep God's commandments, but we're also sent the spirit as our helper. Verse 18 of John 14, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. This is only possible when the work that we do is done with a true dependence on the Spirit. It's not this like mystical, ethereal, mountaintop situation. It is simply asking the Spirit for help. That through times of spiritual drought, we ask for God to, God to encourage us through the Spirit. That through times of great progress, we thank the Spirit for his help and ask him to continue to help us. Depending upon the Spirit isn't for this next tier of Christianity. It is for every single believer. So that brings us to our third point. We've talked about the foundation. Uh, We've talked about our second point, which is to pursue the goal. And finally, it is taking hold of the mindset. Verse 15. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will, will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. In verse 16, he's starting to move towards, or he does move towards this final exhortation with 17 and on following. But he gives us two small exhortations. The first is to have the same mindset as Paul. Let those of us who are mature, that can also be translated as perfect not saying that we are perfect, but again, pointing out the, the faultiness of the, of the Judaizers. But he says, again, let those of us who are mature think this way. If you are pursuing Christ, if you want to be a mature Christian, if you want to grow in Christ-likeness, think this way. <clears throat> Godliness must be your highest pursuit must be our highest pursuit. And if we think otherwise, God will reveal that also to us. You can see almost the the pride that Paul has in the Philippians and that he's not correcting them strongly, but he's encouraging them. It's the soft exhortation, a prodding in the right direction, urging us along with this church to respond to the truth that's been clearly laid out. Take this mindset If you don't have this mindset, it'll be shown to you, whether it's through your scriptures, through your fellowship with other believers, watching someone who's more mature than you. 
God will reveal to us where we aren't thinking rightly about godliness. This forces us to ask the question of whether or not we're spiritually mature. Forces us to look at ourselves and ask, am I spiritually mature? Am I thinking in this way? Am I getting distracted by other things? Or is my focus solely on Christ? On attaining godliness? It forces us to ask what areas of our lives we aren't measuring up in. And that so clearly the application is that we put on the same mindset as Paul. And we could talk about all these vague uh, different ways that that might apply, but really, it's simple. Focus solely on the prize. Maybe for you, that means that you need to better understand what, what final godliness, what, what being made new, what getting a resurrection body actually looks like. Instead of thinking that it's too hard for the average Christian, study it and study it deeply so that you have a good grasp on what's coming for us, on what's, what's on the other side of really this age. It means that we're focused solely on Christ and we're not distracted by other things in the race. It comes down to asking what we're distracted by and these things can be good things but if they distract us from the ultimate thing, pursuing Christ-likeness, then they become sinful. So what are you distracted by? Are you distracted by your hobbies, whether it's golf, mountain biking, hiking, video games, reading, movies, music, cars, friends, pets, sports? Or maybe you're distracted as a parent by your kids' hobbies. I think that's one of the the biggest things that, that's a distraction to Christian parents is our kids' hobbies, whether it's sports or other things. If there's any chance that it's taking you or your family away from godliness, then it needs to be reevaluated. There's many things that distract us. Family, marriage, other relationships, uh, work, politics, they aren't necessarily wrong. Our kids' hobbies, our hobbies... Our work, our families, our relationships can be good things, but if they are taking our minds away from godliness, then they are bad, they become bad things. This isn't a call for us to build a Country Oaks commune in the middle of Sand Canyon, away from the world, but it's a call for us to to refocus, to reshift our minds. Everything we do and shaped is by what we consider to be a goal of our lives. And if the goal is not godliness, then you're distracted by the things of this world. Living godly lives requires a singular focus of of doing what it takes. That doesn't mean we cut off everything like I said, but what it means is doing all these things with a pursuit of righteousness, of repenting of our sins, of, of working hard as unto the Lord, of obeying Christ in all things, in our marriages, in our parenting, in our work, our play, in our friendships, in every aspect of our lives. Our focus is loving God and loving our neighbor. So to wrap all of this up, the godly Christian life requires a single-minded focus on Christ, like a runner who is racing to the finish line, not distracted by anything else. One author puts it this way, He uses a different illustration. The Christian life should be like a sword with one point, not like a broom ending in many straws. Such a single purpose forgets the past, reaches toward the future, and presses on. There is no time or place for side issues, diversions to the the right or to the left. There is no place for hands on the plow with eyes looking back. Paul was a one-track man, but you can go a long way on one track. That is our lives, a single focused track, a single focus like the point at the end of a sword, the tip of the spear. Paul went a long way with this single-minded track. He knew that he finished the race well. He says that he fought the fight, that he has run the race but he knows he didn't do it on his own. He's continually pointing to Christ. He fully depended on God, and that's why he finished well. 
And that's how we too can finish well. So take on this same mindset as Paul. Take on the single-minded focus on Christ and becoming like him and knowing him fully. And let that focus be affecting every aspect of your lives, of our lives, a singular focus on God's glory. I'm going to close with this exhortation from 1 Timothy 4, 7 to 10. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Don't get distracted. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So hold true to what you believe, stand fast in the faith, toil and strive for the promise of the present life and the life to come for the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the promises that you've given to us, that we don't run this race aimlessly or in vain, but we, we run this race with a singular goal that is laid out clearly for us. I pray that we would hold tight to this goal, that we would, um, we would hold tight to the truth that we have attained and let that shape our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.